Thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. This is the best-selling climbing book of all time. It's based on a lie. The book is called Annapurna, and it chronicles a 1950 French expedition that became the first to ever summit a mountain taller than 8,000 meters. It's an incredible story, an uncharted land, this deadly mountain, and the expedition leader heroically summoning his force for one last desperate push to the top. The thing is, it's not true. Now, when I say that it's a lie, I'm being a little bit uncharitable. There was a 1950 expedition, and they did summit Annapurna, but the book is a delicate balance of fact and fiction, half historical account, and half grandiose adventure novel. The author, Maurice Herzog, paints himself as the hero of the story, over-exaggerating some parts, completely omitting others until the book is less historical account and more like a fairy tale. It would be decades until the true story of Annapurna came out in a book titled True Summit. In it, author Dave Roberts says, Annapurna was nothing more than a gilded myth, one man's romantic idealization of the campaign that had claimed the first 8,000 meter peak. What really happened in 1950 was far darker, more complex, more nebulous than anything Herzog had written. The thing is, at its core, Annapurna is a romantic story. From the period of 1900 to 1950, 22 expeditions had tried and failed to place a human being on top of a mountain higher than 8,000 meters. It was considered one of the greatest exploratory goals left remaining on the planet. At the same time, French morale was at an all-time low in the aftereffects of World War II and the German occupation. With all of this put together, the expedition to Annapurna became about more than just mountaineering. Robert says, Annapurna was conceived as a grand nationalistic effort. The mountaineering society was highly sensitive to the prevailing notion that France had done next to nothing in the Himalaya. And in 1950, the whole country still lay mired in the humiliation of World War II, a once proud nation conquered so easily by the Third Reich, liberated not so much by the resistance as by the Allies. And so, wanting to prove themselves as a mountaineering superpower and looking to reinstill a sense of national pride that had been missing for a decade, the French Mountaineering Society assembled one of the greatest expedition teams that the world has ever seen to this day. It was spearheaded by names like Maurice Herzog, Louis Lachenal, Gaston Rebuffon, Lionel Torre, and Jean Cousy. Specifically, Lachenal, Rebuffon, and Terre were the backbone of the expedition and were considered three of the best climbers in the world at the time. Before even leaving for the Himalaya, the mountaineers were called into Herzog's office and forced to take what was essentially an oath of loyalty, swearing to obey his every command. In Annapurna, Herzog paints this as a solemn, almost mystical moment. They're no longer just a collection of climbers, they represent the hopes and dreams of France. In the book, Herzl says, They were pledging me their lives and they knew it. In that moment, our team was born. The team departs for Nepal, and on your first read, this is where the fun starts. Herzl has a strange, almost detached writing style that makes it hard to pick out the individual personalities of the climbers on the expedition. Instead, they're more just this anamorphous group that's having fun on this expedition in what was essentially an uncharted country. There will be long stretches of dialogue where you're not actually sure who's speaking, and it all serves to create this image that it's not about the individual, it's about the group. A quick word from today's sponsor, Squarespace. Guys, I've done a lot of ads with Squarespace before in the past, and it's honestly because I genuinely think they have a great platform. They're the best place to build a website and promote your personal brand if you don't have coding experience and you don't want to have to worry about building stuff from the ground up. You can pick from the website theme that you want, you can create exclusive content, you can view analytics, you can link to your socials. There's a lot of stuff you can do to make it as easy as possible to build the best website you possibly can. If you want to launch your own personal brand, start an online business, or just offer content online, Squarespace is the best place to do it. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial and use the code ascensionism for 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain if you want to give the channel a little bit of support. For the first half of the book, the team barely even sees Annapurna. 
in the massive Himalayan range, in an area where they have basically no maps, they probe this way and that, searching for a way to access the base of the mountain, while also running reconnaissance on the nearby Dwalagiri, another peak that they were thinking about climbing. Here, the team is often at odds with each other about what strategy to best pursue. Herzog, the ex-military man, is the wise, patient leader of the group, taking into account everyone's feedback and making the best decision for the team, and by kind of filtering everything out and only focusing on the necessities, they're finally able to gain access to Annapurna. The team finds a potential line up the mountain. Tere and Lachanel, bored of all the walking around, want to launch an all-out attack on this challenging rock rib, but once again, the patience and wisdom of Herzo takes over. Instead, he finds a way up a nearby glacier that gains them access to an easier route that looks entirely feasible. The goal is now in sight, but now there's a new challenge. They're running out of time. With the monsoon bearing down, the team has less than two weeks to make it to the summit. Again, Herzo is the mastermind here, coordinating supplies as they're shuffled up and down the mountain, moving base camp, scheduling Sherpas, and most of all, being on the front lines of the climbing as he pushes camps 2, 3, and 4 while the other members of the expedition suffer from exhaustion and altitude sickness. Finally, the moment of reckoning arrives. With the monsoon just barely days away, Lachanel and Herzo leave on a final push to the summit. There will be no time for a second attempt. After two months of travel and hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of funding, the expedition has pushed all in on these two climbers. On June 3rd, 1950, they leave Camp 5 and make for the summit. Here, the book reaches what I think is the climax. About 1,500 feet below the top, fearing frostbite, Lachanel stops her Zoe and asks him, what will you do if I turn around? In his internal dialogue, Herzo says, a whole sequence of pictures flashed through my head. The days of marching in sweltering heat, the hard pitches we had overcome, the tremendous effort, the daily heroism of my friends in establishing camps. Must we give up? Impossible. My whole being revolted against the idea. I had made up my mind irrevocably. Today, we were consecrating an ideal and no sacrifice was too great. I heard my voice say clearly, I shall go by myself. Lachanel then responds, then I'll go with you. This is the pinnacle of the book. Herzo, the leader of the team, understands the enormity of the task that he's been entrusted with. He's not a mountaineer just trying to get to the top. He is a representation of the hopes and dreams of France and all the funding and all the effort and everything that has gone into this expedition. And he truly believes that nothing will stand in the way of him getting to the top. In this moment, this, this tender exchange between two men on the, the edge of human habitation this bravery inspires Lachanel to overcome his fear and overcome his worries about frostbite and accompany him as they make their way towards their goal. Together, the two of them fight their way up a few final obstacles and then they arrive. They have summited Annapurna. They're the first human beings to ever top a peak taller than 8,000 meters. On the descent, things start to go wrong. I won't go into the whole series of events, but essentially both Herzo and Lachanel end up suffering severe frostbite that costs them all of their toes as well as most of Herzo's fingers. They make it back safely, they have the requisite surgeries, and they return to France heroes. In the book, Herzo doesn't bemoan his injuries. Instead, he treats it as a sort of rebirth, the start of a new life post-Annapurna. In the closing remarks, he says, Annapurna, to which we had gone empty-handed, was a treasure on which we could live the rest of our days. With this realization, we turn the page. A new life begins. There are other Annapurnas in the lives of men. No matter what else is said in this video, I want to make clear, I love this ending, and I love this book. This overriding message of, of heading off into the unknown and Pushing your limits in order to find deeper meaning is incredible and prevalent and moving, and I think it's something people should hear, but it's not the entire story. You see, there are key elements that Herzo omitted from Annapurna that, when you read them, change the way you have to view the expedition. First, and maybe foremost, is the fact that right before leaving, literally as they were packing up the plane, 
Herzog suddenly dropped it on the other members of the expedition that they had to sign contracts preventing them from publishing any account of Annapurna for five years after they returned. This might not sound like a big deal, but it was huge. In particular, Lachanel, Rebuffon, and There were full-time guides, and they were giving up an entire season of summer guiding in Chamonix in order to attend this expedition for which they didn't get paid for. Now they weren't allowed to write books, newspapers, magazines, articles, nothing, nothing recalling their accounts so that they could profit off of the time that they put into this expedition. It also meant that Herzog got to control the narrative around the book. He is the hero of the story. Strong, patient, wise, he is the driving force that gets them to the summit. Upon returning to France, this image elevated him to the status of national hero. He was able to build a successful political career off of that image painted in Annapurna and off of downplaying the achievements of his teammates. Probably no one suffered more from this than Louis Lachenal. In the book, Lachenal is painted as almost this tortured genius, a incredibly talented but half-crazed climber who almost loses his mind due to fear of frostbite on the way down and constantly has to be reined in and controlled by Herzog. Lachenal was aware of this and after the five-year time limit expired, he was planning to publish his own series of events that has now been recovered. In it, the Annapurna expedition looks very different. The group, instead of being a united noble team, is rife with conflict, poorly organized, and bickering with each other. Herzog makes several key judgment errors, like overcommitting to Dwalagiri, which almost cost them their summit. More specifically, there are two key differences in Lachenal's series of events. Do you remember that spur that I was talking about that Lachenal and There wanted to attempt, but Herzog reined them in and instead went around on the glacier? In reality, Herzog participated in a three-day attempt up that very same spur. It was actually Gaston Rebuffon who picked a really clever line up the glacier that would eventually lead to the summit. David Robert says, For the rest of his life, Rebuffon harbored a bitterness towards Herzog for not sufficiently acknowledging the critical jumpstart in the expedition's fortunes that his reconnaissance up the glacier had provided. The other discrepancy occurs at the climax of the book when Lachenal is prepared to turn around and Herzog inspires him to push on with him. Writing in his own words, Lachenal is much less dramatic about what actually happened. He says, For me, this climb was only a climb like others, higher than the Alps, but no more important. If I was going to lose my feet, I didn't give a damn about Annapurna. I didn't owe my feet to the youth of France. Thus, I wanted to go down. I posed the question to Maurice to find out what he would do in that case. He told me he would keep going. I didn't need to judge his reasons. Alpinism is too personal a business. But I guessed that if he continued alone, he would not return. It was for him and him alone that I did not turn around. Instead of being inspired by his nationalist hero, caught up in this vision of consecrating an ideal, Lachenal went to the summit out of concerns for Herzl's safety, and it cost him his toes and very nearly his life. It gets worse. Lachenal wanted to publish all of this along with his diary that he kept throughout the expedition in a paper called Commentaries. Before he could, though, he died in a skiing accident. In what seems like, and probably was, an act of altruism, Herzl stepped in to assume the role of tutor over Lachenal's two sons, essentially becoming the legally appointed guardian of the family. In this position, Herzl also gained control over the unpublished book. Working together with his brother, he combed through it, removing anything that contradicted the narrative that he had built in the original Annapurna publication. By the time it finally hit the shelves, Lachenal's story was diluted of any contradictions or any truth behind the expedition and really just affirmed what Herzl had written himself five years earlier. It would be 50 years and some pretty serious investigative reporting before the truth finally came out. Opinions on Annapurna, especially in France, are now split. Some people still view Herzl as a national hero and take the events described in Annapurna to essentially be the truth with a little dramatic flair here and there. Others view him less favorably, and I would really encourage everyone to read both the original Annapurna and Dave Roberts' book True Summit, because I haven't covered all of the details here, and it's important to 
get a full picture so that you can actually form your own opinion. Based on the title of this video, you can probably tell where I fall on this issue. I know it's an inflammatory word to use, but given everything, the, the last minute contract, the changing narrative, the scrubbing of Lachanel's story, I can't view Annapurna as anything but a scam. Not just scamming the guides out of their public image and their right to make money off of the sacrifices they made on the mountain, but scamming the people of France from knowing what actually happened up there on the slopes of Annapurna in 1950. Because of that, as moving as I find the conclusion of the original book that there are other Annapurnas in the lives of men, I think the final word on this matter deserves to go to Louis Lachenal. Describing his take on June 3rd, he said that march to the summit was not a matter of national glory. It was une affaire de cordie. For those of us who don't speak French, that means it was a rope affair, just two climbers doing what climbers do. Going to the summit not for honor or glory or France, but because they're climbers and it was there. Alright, thank you guys for watching. Let me know, do you have your own opinions on the Annapurna story? What happened? Did I miss anything in this video? Especially anyone who really knows about the mountaineering scene in France. Let me know what people think of this book in hindsight. Thank you guys as always. Catch you next time.